The first individual is well known in his field as a behavioral epidemiologist, a consultant, an educator, and a Buddhist practitioner. He is a subject matter expert in cognition and behavior. He is a speaker and a consultant on topics including parenting, child development, organization, behavior, and motivation, evolutionary psychology, the, the psychology of nature, and mindfulness practices in daily living. So please welcome Dr. Summer David. Dr. Davis holds a doctoral uh, degree in Christian theology. Okay. Uh, he also held a Master of Divinity in Comparative Religion he, and a Master of Science in Community Psychology and a Master degree in Public Health. Also a Certificate of Advanced Study in System Theory as well as a BA in Psychology with a double major, uh, minor of Anthropology and sci so Sociology. That's it. Boy. And uh, doc Dr. David currently working on his uh, PhD in epi Epidemiology focused on behavior and health education. So according to my math, he holding one and a half PhD degree, <laughs> uh, three master degrees, one BA degrees, and one certification. It's a lot of people. You need a big wall. <laughs> and uh, with Dr. David today uh, is our second individual. He's a rising star in Baton Rouge. <laughs> he has seven years of counseling experience and has worked with diverse populations, include youth and elders. He's a, a frequent presenter at the Interface Summit with other community religious leaders and a frequent invited lecturer at Religion Institute and classes in Louisiana State University, Southern East, Southeastern Louisiana University local schools, and many Vietnamese communities across the United States. He holds weekly sermons and teachings in Buddhism to the Vietnamese and Americans several times a week. He provides short-term counseling on family issues, face-to-face only, no phone, no on the phone. So don't call him. You, you need him to come to Baton Rouge. Uh, culture issue and family conflict, and he led he leads a mindfulness meditation in several treatment centers in Louisiana. He currently received uh, his bachelor's degree in psychology at Georgia State University. He has a master's degree in education in uh, community counselor, counseling at Southeastern Louisiana University. And he currently completed his PhD in health psychology. He currently also works three jobs. First job is a teacher, second job is a counselor, and most important job is he's an abbot at the Tam, Tam Bao Buddhist Temple in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Please welcome our famous Kai Tao Quan. Uh, when I provide the marriage counseling, at this time I see how many couple. About four couple, I try my best to save the marriage life. Um, and I want to clarify that I don't take uh, the code ethic, I don't provide long distance marriage family counseling. However, if you need some consultation, feel free to contact with me. Uh, I'm happy to do that. But no officially responsible for all the council section. Uh, let me begin this uh, powerful quote and I really like that. I strongly believe that love, compassion and understanding is the foundation of any relationship. Any relationship, love, understanding 
and compassion as its foundation. Do you agree? I agree. And this is a powerful quote from His Holiness the Dalai Lama. Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. I completely, totally agree. It survives by badly. Today, in this session, basically, we try the best to share with you and collaborate with each other to answer four basic questions. First, how to create and maintain healthy, lovely relationships. Second, how to balance the relationship in your personal and professional life. Third, how to liberate ourselves from unhealthy relationship and attachment, especially for women. I'm sorry, for men. <laughs> How to truly love ourselves through relationship with those around us. This is first, right? I think this is a very uh, basic topic for everyone. Even if you participate in the nutrition, awakening or not, you have to face with this. When I say relationship, I don't mean only the relationship between husband and wife, but also in general, right? All of us establish relationship, even Juan he is single, a valuable man, but he still have a, a bunch of relationship in his life, right? Yeah. Brother, sister, students, so and so. Uh, so I think we should look at the relationship in different aspects of life. And also sometimes you have to see that your husband sometimes play the role of your young brother also. <laughs> yes. Your wife sometimes she may Play the role of spoiling yeah. girl, right? <laughs> sometimes, or sometimes the husband play the role of five-year-old in the family. You have to take care of him also. So look at this, and you see the very uh, interesting about when you look deeply about this subject about relationship. So uh, that is the first thing I want to emphasize. And next, let's see. Who I think he's the right man to talk about this. <laughs> is this on? <clears throat> okay. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is the commonalities. Humans are animals. Um, Western and Middle Eastern religions teach you that you are not part of nature, you're above nature, but in fact you're not. Um, one of the things that really impresses me about Buddhism is that it follows science. And if you're going to ignore science, you're ignoring reality. Now, religion ignores reality quite frequently. We do not. Give me five. We look for commonalities. Why do you like each other? Because you recognize part of yourself in another person. We like those who are like ourselves because we don't want conflict. We're social animals. We're pack animals. We're herd animals. As herd animals, we look for one alpha leader. This is why Western religion and Middle Eastern religion works so well. It says, you're stupid, you're a follower, but here's God and he's the leader. And you go, okay. <laughs> when you question this, they don't like it. We question everything. The Buddha said, if you hear something, don't just take anybody's word, not even mine. Think for yourself. This is incompatible with Western religious thought. Our desire to form relations is multifaceted. It's neurochemically through oxytocin. Um, when a woman gives birth, she, her body releases enormous amounts of oxytocin. Oxytocin is the, is the companion chemical. It's what makes us attach. And there are a few attachments, okay? There are the mother-infant, the strongest one. All of your relationships for the rest of your life are based upon the first 18 months of your existence. Um, Father-child is also important, but secondary to mother-child. Um, pair bonding, romantic, this is what robins do, swans do, they bond for life. Okay. Swans' brains emit oxytocin and they pair bond. 
which is why even if we're in a relationship which is difficult, we don't like to remove from it. Part of this is psychological, part of it is neurological. We've bonded with that person. That person is a part of ourselves. So even though we may have a cancerous limb and we know it needs to be cut off, we don't want to separate from it. You hear that? Can you repeat that one more time? I don't remember. <laughs> even if we have a cancerous limb and we know it needs to be cut off, we still have a difficult time letting go of it. The pair bond is based on three things, okay? The first thing is reproduction, obviously. And the second thing is attachment. If we had a healthy attachment with our mother, our primary caregiver, then we're going to seek a healthy attachment with another person, another adult. Same sex, different sex, doesn't matter. We're looking for the same qualities that we have. So if we have a good, supportive relationship with our mother and then our father, we are going to seek that same sort of healthy relationship. So when you see somebody who is in a difficult relationship, don't let me get too far off track, Turn me back. And you say, I don't understand what she gets from this. I was like, no, you can't see it because you have a healthy perception. They do not, they are getting something. May be a mystery to you. It's probably a mystery to them, but they're doing something. Finally, um, we have the the uh, friend slash companion slash sibling slash kin um, attachment. And if you have siblings, you may be close to them now, but when you were small children, you wanted to kill them. <laughs> This is because our attachments to these people, cousins, friends in the neighborhood, these, they, they wax and wane as we get older. And children are very different. And so we seek different people to be friends with. And as we get older, we become accustomed to those. I came from a strictly Irish Catholic family um, that parents didn't like children but still had title them, bang, 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 bang. Um, and the hostility in the home was palpable, and so we were very aggressive children. We did not like each other. Today, we like each other fine. But at the time, we did it. So when you ask yourself, why am I friends with this person? If you stop to think, you see something of you in them, and that's what you're identifying with. And this is the subjective nature of relationships is I'm friends, I'm going to say with Brother Will. Now we come from very different backgrounds, but I recognize something in myself, in him, and that's, that's what I'm attaching to. Not the whole person, that aspect. And that aspect is merely my perception. Brother Will may just be doing a facade and fools me, so he may actually make jokes about me to Matt Tay when I'm not around. But my perception is, He's a nice guy. Who's next? Me, you, you. You go. Ready? <laughs> I'm not mindful. <clears throat> uh, before I continue to share, I strongly recommend if anyone who have a symptom of falling asleep, please sit back. Okay. Uh, and continue, uh, I, I want to share a thing about, uh, this is related to our practice about in any relationship, believe it or not, we always attack. Without attack, you cannot bond in your relationship. But the question is, what Paul is considered as an unhealthy relationship, right? The too much attack is not good. For example, being a monk, if you do not attack to the teacher and Buddha, so you don't have a motivation to continue to practice, if you marry some Brother, sister, and if you don't have the bond and attachment, how, do you, how can you maintain the long-term relationship? No way, right? But the question is, in terms of practice, you have to be, be aware of this. I like this picture. How many of you see your, 
see a picture in the slideshow, please let me know so that I can remove that. <laughs> I strongly believe that the first thing you have to uh, develop that is develop a positive relationship with self. Develop a positive relationship with self. Um, this is really hard to practice, but you have to uh, love yourself with unconditional positive regard. Let me share with you about my, my practice. I reflect on myself. I try my best to reflect on myself. Every present moment, or hourly, or daily, or at least monthly, uh, based on our culture, we have a beginning of new repentance services. And I recognize my weaknesses, but I just uh, accept it. And I look at my positive side, right? So I don't beat up myself. Much. So, but how about the picture of the wonderful girl on your right side? That's not about unconditional positive regard. Um, so, and also, in terms of develop the positive relationship with others, like uh, Brother Will just mentioned. This is from Buddhist perspective, and the Buddha taught at the beginning. We have to see ourselves from the others. Right? We have to practice how we can see we relate it to the other. Especially if we are Vietnamese American. I see that my identity is somehow is related to your identity. Right? And, and we look at bigger picture. Uh, we are humans. And I see your suffering or your happiness also influence on my life. And I see that my happiness or unhappiness also impact on you. For example, at this moment, if I show unhappiness face, I do believe this is the worst session in this retreat, right? Because all negative information from my voice, from my action, is this impact on the whole group. So you have to see that, see ourselves related from the other. And also, I think this is a good practice Good practice. Good question. Hi. Uh, one question about loving oneself. What is the fine line between loving oneself in a positive way and so thinking of yourself as superior to other people? How about this? How about this? This is it. All the questions you have related to this question, write down. So when we finish, we have a 40 question for Q&A section. If any question related, for example, if I say some work is not clear, feel free to ask questions. But any question related to the, to the topic, could you please allow me to answer all these questions so that I can follow my talk? Okay? Thank you. See. <clears throat> so, we have to practice seeing ourselves. Uh, myself is related to your life also. So, maybe when you have this perception, this right way of thinking, then it is maybe easier or better to practice unconditional positive regard. Why a mother can love uh, her child without condition? Why? Because she sees that her future right there, right? all her life, all investment right there. Yesterday in the section I had with the youngest group, their happiness depends so much on the life of their children. So I can see that if you practice, you see uh, you, your life is cannot be separate from the others. Inner peace also uh, is very important. If you want to develop a positive relationship with anyone, with anyone, including your brother, sister, husband, and wife, try your best, best to maintain your positive energy and inner peace. I share with you, if I have an easy day, when I say easily, that means the day I have a more positive energy, more inner peace. If you say something, if you do something is horrible or bad, or you make any mistake, or even my student brother will, he forget to sit beside the cinema monk this morning to recite um, the Gata in English, I forget easily because I have a lot of inner peace. But if I do not have no inner peace, is maintain the positive relationship with myself and the others is very talented. 
So, the next thing I want to share, that is we have to see the strength and weaknesses, right? Weaknesses or goodness, or you may say, strength and weaknesses. In any relationship, including ourselves and anyone, we have tried the best to see it, right? And from my practice, when I provide the counsel to any couple marriage, you know they have a tendency to dig the big hole in the negative side. The husband always point the finger to whom? To the wife. The wife always blame on the husband. You, you. And sometimes I say, you never ever mention about this person in your, in your section. It's about yourself. Sometimes I have to borrow the mirror and I say, look at this person. You never ever mention about this person. So, you have to <coughs> make this uh, practice more practical in your life. I say, when you see something negative, please liberate from the negative thinking, negative behavior, and focus on positive. And practice, forgive for yourself. The first thing, forgive for yourself before you practice, forgive to the other. I love the teaching from His Holiness Dalai Lama, and this has uh, become my favorite quote 2013, 2012 actually. Forgiveness cannot change the past. However, it opened the opportunity for future. And I strongly believe that. If you get mad at someone, even if you forgive him or her, you cannot change the past, right? If you're not happy with me yesterday for any reason, you forgive me or not forgive me, we cannot change the past. But when you practice forgiving, first is benefit. You continue to nurture the seed of love, compassion in your heart, in your mind. And possible, many possibility um, to transform the relationship in the future. But unfortunately, unfortunately, majority human beings have a tendency to hold on the negative. If you do 10 good things on this pen, they may not remember it. Or they may remember in a short period of time. But if you do one bad thing, they may remember that for many, many times. That is the reason. That is the reason. I strongly recommend, brother, sister, when you post any picture, especially my picture, <laughs> on the papers, please see me, okay? Because I want to send out all the positive energy, positive image from this retreat. That's all about. Um, also, you see, related to the other through the <coughs> goodnesses or strength. When you become a positive person, quote unquote, I can see it changing unexpectedly. You're very happy in this section, in the next section, because of the cooking staff is being late a little bit, getting online, and I asking you to be patient when you hold the food, a delicious place in front of you already. I ask you please be patient and practice fine contemplation. You may become unhappy at that moment already. So, so try the best to see that. You maintain positive behavior is influence the whole community. And same thing. Uh, the community maintain more positive brother sister in this group is make the retreat of awakening is become a big difference in the practice. And this is very uh, simple rule but it's really hard to practice, that is, through compassion and understanding in our perception gym. And I see this is interrelated. When you have a positive thinking, uh, it's easy to develop compassion and love. But then you, when you hold on many negative thoughts in your mind, it is almost impossible, it is almost impossible to develop love and compassion. Uh, I, I teach myself, See the good thing for all brothers and sisters in the community. Even they're Buddhist or not Buddhist, it doesn't matter. As long as they carry the positive behavior, the goodness is, I follow them. And this is the reason I like Buddhism again. Sometimes I see there are many similarities between Buddhist practitioner and Christian practitioner. And there are many similarities between Buddhist believer without practice and Christian believer without practice. Are you agree? 
Do you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You know I don't keep the relationship with you too. <laughs> How about you? Just uh, one more thing to follow up. Um, reality is not dependent upon your perception. And that's a difficult thing for most people to understand. If while you're here, you're, you lost your job at work, when would you become upset about that? When you found out, right? But you still didn't have the job right now because your perception hadn't been altered yet. And we, when we allow ourselves to be trapped in our perceptions, that's when we open ourselves up to the problem. The other thing was about relationships. The Irish have a saying, happy wife, happy life. I like to tell people, happy wife, happy life. I, I like to tell people, keep your wife and your girlfriend happy and separated. I want to talk a little bit about ego. And I don't mean the Freudian construct of ego being that you remember, um, you remember when you were adult, you didn't take psychology, you were smarter than me. Um, we all exist as three people. We are born with an id, a sensory um, motivated creature that only wants to eat and consume and, and poop. That's all it wants to do. And then we have ego, and ego is the real thing. The ego tries to meditate, tries to mediate the problems. Super ego is the rules and regulations of society. And how I teach this annoying and difficult construct to my intro to psychology students is I say, here's a joke. The ego, the id, and the superego go to a nightclub. How many guys here have been to a nightclub? <laughs> Just a few. Well, then you won't get this joke. Did you let like three people get it? Yeah. So the id says, oh look, there's Susan. She looks great. The superego says, are you crazy? That's your cousin's best friend's sister. You can't do that. And the ego goes, but wait, I have a plan. And that's what the ego does. It tries to keep everybody happy. The it doesn't get what it wants. The superego doesn't get what it wants. But Freud was wrong. So <laughs> we talk about the ego. We talk about the illusion of control. The ego is manifested by a need to control things, okay? It expects to be A, always in control. B, even in intimate relationships, we hold back. We hold back, why? Because we think we need to maintain the upper hand, and the upper hand is control. Fear is always at the root of control, always. Anybody who's a control freak, who needs to be in control is terrified. Always. This is just the way it is. This is how emotion works. The biggest obstacle to a healthy relationship, whether it's a sibling relationship, a master-student relationship, a romantic relationship, a familiar relationship, is fear. Fear that I'm somehow exposing myself in some way that I can be damaged. This person will take advantage of this. Nations do this all the time. It's called warfare. It's the illusion of control. And mindfulness practice alerts us to this. And what I do with my students, and when I was practicing psychology with my patients, is I would say, um, stop at any moment in the day and be mindful of what you're thinking, and you will find 90% of the time, it's a negative thought. 90% of the time, it's bad. I should have, I could have, I didn't. He said, she said, they said, I didn't, I failed in some way. And so, once you recognize this, then you can work to undo it. Now, what I did with my Intro to Psychology course, because my, my psychology courses are heavy in mindfulness. Um, I took half my class. I said, if your social security number ends with an with even number, stay after class. Odd number, leave. And I said to the kids who were there, 
I want you to do this. I want you to, once a week, write down everything good that happened to you that week. And even if it's just one thing, even if it's my goldfish didn't die, write that down. <laughs> then the next Monday, I did a general happiness scale, and I found they were both the same. And at the end of the semester, I did it again. Guess who was happier? The kids who practiced being thankful. Because that's the only difference, is perception. You are as happy or as miserable as you want yourself to be. I like this, this lion, piece, which reminds me of, of a brief story, The Monk and the Mirror. Everybody knows this, right? Right? No. No. The monks are going, no, and the rest are going, yes, okay. <laughs> so this, this Buddhist master, um, he has this, this monk. And the monk is always carrying a mirror, and he watches the monk look at the mirror. And go back. And the master goes, that, that monk, he has an ego. I'm going to fix him. And so he gives the monk the hardest tasks, kind of like what Brother Will gets stuck with. <laughs> and the master watches, and he looks in the mirror even more, and he goes, he just doesn't get it. I'll fix him. And he gives him the most difficult task. He's looking there constantly. And the monk goes, oh. I mean, the, the master goes, I've got to find out what is wrong with this monk. And he says, why do you constantly look in that mirror? You're failing. Why are you doing this? And the monk says, I need to know who's at fault. <laughs> suspicion and jealousy. Why are we suspicious of other people in relationships? Number one, Control. Control. And the weird thing is, especially in Asian society, and a lot so in Middle Eastern, suspicion and jealousy are considered positive things. If my husband is suspicious of me, he must love me. Uh, no, he doesn't. <laughs> if my wife is jealous of my new secretary, well, that's just because she loves me. No, no, that's not why. You've done something to create this. Going back to the first slide, relationships. If you are a naturally suspicious person, well, number one, you're not naturally suspicious. You've been trained to be suspicious, probably through previous relationships, and you found that trust is just not something that you can extend to other people. So if that's something that you can work on, where am I? Yes, negative consequences. If your husband is too suspicious, too controlling, what's the next step? Domestic violence, right? Domestic violence, when you, when you talk to a domestic violence perpetrator, do they generally talk to you and say, well, I'm generally a calm person. I'm not violent. I don't have any problems with control. I love everybody. No, no. They're terrified. They're terrified that the person that they're involved with will leave them because they feel the other person has more control. So what they will do is they will intentionally find somebody that they see as damaged that they can manipulate. And when that person gets strength and can resist them, they turn violent because that's what they have to do. Yeah, uh, the gender, gender differences. This I found interesting. Um, women tend to be more jealous of attractiveness and, or popularity. Instead of one more time, louder. Yeah. <laughs> louder, please. If you're a woman, you are more likely to be jealous of your husband's coworker if she's attractive, obviously, right? Or if she's popular. Popular. Read into that whatever you want. Women, you're more likely to um, be jealous of other men yep. than other women. Let me, let me describe a little bit. If you're a woman and you're working in an office and you see another woman who is trying to, to rise up above you, you're less likely to be jealous. If that's a man, you're not like that. So 
So that's interesting. I love to share about what men tell us about, because I'm a man. <laughs> men, based on the research in general, they are more likely jealousy of wealth and fame. And I want to say this very clearly, this is, that's the reason you see uh, we have a lot of conflict about jealousy. And this is the reason uh, I like to see myself, when I be here, it's not about the fame, but I like to serve the community. Even you call, you call me camp director, or a servant, or whatever you want to call, I'm still be here until the rest of the camp. And next year, I will be here. Even uh, I will not be, I will be not re-elected as the camp director. I'm still be here with the positive energy. So I'm working here. It's not about the fame. So, uh, dear gentlemen, so we should be aware of this. We get jealousy about the wealth and fame. That's based on the research. I think this is the good thing you say about suspicious and judgment. Suspicion? Yeah. Um, why do we become suspicious of other people? If we're in a relationship, what are the things that make us suspicious? Insecurity. Right. Our insecurity, okay, whether we're suspicious or not, has little to do with the other person. It's to do with us, our perception. Um, I have a cousin whose fiance chased him for 10 years and finally convinced him, quite a good argument, to marry him. And it was interesting to watch that dynamic unfold because he, she was always suspicious of him with reason. And he hadn't changed. But her perception was that now at least he's my husband. So now I have some control. Do you think she had any control over him? So. None at all. He became worse. He became worse. Um, so, as far as this goes, um, when you start a new relationship, now, what I see happening, especially in young people, is sort of an unease of being alone. If I'm not in a relationship, I need to be. And I was... I will start out with these five things must be met. And after a few weeks, these four things are, are deal breakers for me. And another month, these three things are critically important. And when you get to here, guess what? Okay? If she's breathing, it's fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, our perception over what we expect is still there. It hasn't changed. So now what do we do? We see the faults in that person that we chose. Well, why aren't you like this? Why aren't you like that? I never once. And so we, we deceive ourselves. Better to simply wait. One of the things that I saw when I did family therapy and especially child, um, child therapy is with single moms. They felt they needed to be in a relationship. So they got an abusive relationship and immediately right into another one. Let me say with you about that. Uh, yeah. Beginning with the new relationship, this is a perfect practice uh, in Buddhism because we believe in impermanent. Is this correct? So therefore, you have to practice, you must practice seeing your wife, your husband, brother, sister at the new in every moment. Every early morning when you wake up, look at your husband. Don't say, hey, old man again. <laughs> this is the new man. New, wonderful gentleman, husband. Even you may have a big argument last night. I know that some brothers and sisters, they practice, they nurture their relationship. If you see your husband, your wife, your brother and sister as the old person, you against the teaching of Buddha. I strongly emphasize this. If you believe in impermanent, and then you believe this is the old husband, this is the husband, I married him 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it's the same, that's wrong perception. He changed, but you may not be able to recognize. Don't you think so? Absolutely. 
I see Bill different from a few months ago I met him in Baton Rouge. He looked younger, less pressure, and more knowledge. Do you agree? <laughs> Far be it for me to uh, disagree with my master, so. <laughs> I think maybe the final thing to say yeah, go ahead, is don't be limited by suspicion. Um, Muhammad Ali said, if you think that you're the same person at 20 as you were at 50, you wasted 30 years. I tell my students, don't worry about who this person is, who that person is. Worry about who you are in relation to who you were yesterday, last week, last month. So, a number of studies have been done by mindfulness psychologists, of course, and they've come up with uh, the seven principles. One, enhanced your relationship by knowing the person you're in a relationship with. Know your partner. Don't just be sexual friends. Be spiritual friends, psychological friends. Have hobbies, share things. Yes, physical attractiveness is important, is it? However, what does physical attractiveness generally stem from and develop into? Sexual relations. How many hours in a day? 24. If you're most men, you've got 23 hours, 45 minutes, you've got to find something else to do. So I suggest that you like the person that you're in a relationship with. Because otherwise, it's a lot of downtime that you stare at this person and go, yes, she's cute, but I'm not really interested, I'm going to the bar. Um, nurture your fondness and admiration. Remember why you fell in love. That person has changed. They've probably become more and more like you. I have the belief that when people are together long times, they begin to look like each other. <laughs> I agree. I agree. And, and I've noticed they look like their pets. <laughs> you, can, you can nurture this. What was it that attracted you? Yes, beautiful eyes, high cheekbones, bubbly personality. That attracted you. That didn't keep you. Something kept you. Don't forget what that was. Carl Jung said that relationships are like gardens. You need to tend them. If you don't, weeds, and then everything's lost. Turn towards each other when you have a problem. Do not go talk to your hairdresser. Do not go talk. Do not go talk to your friends at the bar. Right? Do not go talk to your drinking buddies. They are not objective. They have an opinion. Why not address the person that's at the heart of the problem? You. And then say to that person, okay? Can you give them one minute space in each other and talk right now? Yeah, go ahead. And we turn to the person sitting next to you and just have a conversation. We'll wait. Oh, yeah. when there's a problem. If you're going to bed mad, guess what? There's a problem. It is better for you to stay up all night long and miss a day of work and resolve it than to go to bed mad. Always. Because what will you be thinking about all day at work? That idiot, that witch, right? And what was a small problem has now become what? A very large problem. And in relationships, there are catastrophic problems. But 99.9% .9 of problems are minor, short-lived, okay? 
But when we have a problem, we think this is devastating and it's never going to get better. And in reality, it does, fairly quickly. So recognize where there's a conflict and then choose that part of it that can be solved. Don't try to change that person's entire existence. So you, you, uh, you have your wife, your girlfriend, your fiance, and something has happened and it's bothering you. Immediately turn toward them and say, I'm having a problem with this. Don't let it fester. Don't say, you need to stop doing this. Because do they have to? No. no. You'd like them to. So if you explore these things and say, I have a problem with this, they are more likely to be, A, not accused of doing something, and B, compassionate so that they'll say, let me help you with this. The last thing I want to say is, create meaning in your relationship. For the other 23 hours and 45 minutes, find common things that you share. Mountain biking, reading, science fiction movies, something. You don't have to look very hard before you find you have a lot of things in common. So emphasize those. And the final thing, I guess, is it's okay to have an unsolvable problem. It is okay. It doesn't mean it's the end of our relationship of any kind. It just means we're at an impasse. So this is what is really meant by let's agree to disagree. We're not going to let this problem, this issue, define our entire relationship because it's a very small part of it. So we're just not going to agree on this. It's not that important. Move on. All right. And the next thing I'd like to share with you that is that I, we can see the uh, relationship as dynamics. So what does it mean? Um, communication is the key in all relationships. Research indicates very clearly more than 50% of US population has ended up with divorce or separation. Number one reason is not about affair, infidelity, but communication. Especially our wonderful Vietnamese culture. When we have something going on between the relationships, including husband and wife, brother and sister, teacher and student, what usually we do? Pick up the phone, call, talk to someone in Canada, in Vietnam. Sometimes your, your husband's problem it is, he does not know, but his mother-in-law in Vietnam know everything about him. <laughs> That's really bad communication. So like you said, your husband's problem informed to him. This is the rule, not rule, but this is the way I practice at the temple where I live. I don't call my temple, but the temple where I live. If this is something you think I can improve and make my monastic life better, please let me know. If you pick up the phone, I say, Dear Tay, someone say this. I say, please let me know. Who is this? Name? Day of birth, <laughs> social security number. <laughs> if he or she passed away already, please let me know where I can find him in some cemetery, or even cremation site, I can find him before you talk about this. Be specific. But I, I strongly encourage you, young Vietnamese generation, especially Buddhist practitioner, when you see the problem between you and your brother, sister, or in any relationship, please talk directly to that person, right? Or, if you need consultation, find the right person to talk. Do not find Bata. <laughs> <laughs> this is Glenn and Billy. I'll give you a go. Uh, try to, to, to focus on possible solutions. Solve the problems. It's not try to create more problems. This is the thing I say directly to my parents. Many times, I say, if you have problem, talk to each other first. Lately, if you do camera, don't share this video to my parents. <laughs> Sometimes my mother comes and says, Take would you tell daddy do this, doing that? I say, not my business. When you're dating me, 
he did not let me know. <laughs> when you were married, you never have a discussion with me. Now you have a problem, you call me, that's not fair. <laughs> you create the problem, sit down and discussion. Don't be afraid and run away. Right? That's what we call um, fight on flight. Or flight, right? Most of the time we flight. Uh, flight in the wrong direction also. Looking for the, the path we uh, create, the, uh, the opportunity to enhance the, your relationship. For example, I do believe that most of you, when you fall in love with someone, that means you like something first, right? And then you create a wonderful relationship. Please continue to nurture relationship. I know some couple sitting here, like uh, one time a week, invite each other, sit outside, look at the moon, read the poem, <laughs> sing a song, but don't sing too much. <laughs> Sometimes, the, I know the family, one couple, they have problem because the wife, she always likes to sing a song. <laughs> and the husband said, please stop, leave me alone. <laughs> I need to take a break. <laughs> I listen to all the professional singers already. And think about this. Uh, trust, trust is also a very important factor. When you lose the trust, that means you damage the relationship. I like the music with this uh, statement. Um, Have a little faith in me. Who knows that song? Because I work at the treatment center, whenever any clients graduate from the treatment center, they always knew that song. I just remember only one sentence. Have a little faith in me, have a little faith in me. <laughs> Trust each other. I make mistake. Give me time to transform my negative behavior. Give me the time, support me to transform this. Right? I strongly recommend all Vietnamese women should make an appointment with Hillary Clinton and learn many lessons from her, right? When she recognized the mistake from her husband, she support him to continue his job, right? Finally, win-win situation, right? Most of the time, we react based on our wrong perception and particularly for wonderful women, based on your emotion and react. That's 1995, you destroy your relationship. It's up to build your relationship. And finally, I just say that um, you have to um, apply the concept confidentiality activity in Vietnamese culture. Your husband's problem, please talk to him. Share with him. If you see your wife have some weaknesses, I don't want to say bad or good, weaknesses and strength. Share with him. For example, you say, dear my wonderful husband, everything you do I am very like. Only one thing I do not like to see this happen again. Could you please fold your clothes whenever you do the laundry? Could you please, when you take up your shoes, don't throw on my lap? Something very simple, but let him know about that. Is that to pick up the phone and talk to someone is not related to him at all. So, relationship satisfaction. How you feel about somebody is entirely your perception. Hillary Clinton, you brought up Hillary Clinton, so now she's fair, fair game. Hillary Clinton said vast right-wing conspiracy. That one time it wasn't. <laughs> um, her perception was different than when she found the truth, right? Did the truth alter? Was anything different? from when she first heard about it until she found out for sure. No, her perception. That changed how she felt, felt. And our feelings are based on our perceptions. And what I see a lot of in my college students is shyness. Um, not so much in the American kids, but certainly in the Asian kids, and in a lot of the European kids as well. Um, sort of the uh, feeling overwhelmed by American culture. Um, 
their, their peers are brash and loud and obnoxious and usually fat and, um, <laughs> and just mm. And they just do this because it's like, oh my god. And shyness is generally, from a psychological standpoint, based on your satisfaction with yourself. If you're shy, you're introverted, okay? Incidentally, if you're born after 1990, there's a very good chance that you are extroverted in America. But this is based on your feeling that you're somehow not worth knowing. Your self-satisfaction is low. You're not out there. You, nobody wants you to be out there. A lot of this comes from introversion, extroversion. Um, I also study a thing called locus of control. Anybody ever heard that before? Besides Ted. Locus of control means, where do I get my meaning? From my Mercedes Benz or from my peace? I was, I've made so many friends in the last few days and we were talking this morning and I said, oftentimes when I ask a young lady, well, tell me about yourself. I can know within three minutes how old she is, what she does, where she lives. Does that tell me about them? Yeah. And then they always look at me like this when I say, okay, well, that's what you do, where you live, how old you are, where you went to school. What about you? And I can see this expression of, I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And that's because this society has fostered two possible outcomes. One, we buy into the crazy American society. Two, we live in our heads. And if we live in our heads, then we put up a wall of our name, when, where we were born, what we do, but that's not us. That's just that. And the problem comes when we pull this into relationships. So, if you're in a, if, especially if you're a younger person, I'm not gonna pick on the young people. Okay, yes I am. If you're in a, in a romantic relationship with somebody, stop and ask yourself, aside from where they were born, how old they are, what they like to do, what do you know about them? Probably not a lot, if anything. And so if that sort of superficial reality works, then I, I guess, you know, right. But eventually, you're going to get to know the, the person better. The last thing I want to say is, I come from a culture where there were no whirlwind romances. If you liked a girl on the next farm, okay, then you would go to a matchmaker. And then you would do what's, what's, what, what is called sitting in. And you would sit in a room, apart, okay, with a, sh with a chaperone, usually the matchmaker, who was usually a man, or her mother or her sister. And you would have conversation. And you would do this for about three to four months. In three to four months of having a lot of conversation, you get to know people. And then, once that had occurred, then you would do stepping out. You would go out with a chaperone. And you would do that for a few months. The end result was, it wasn't quite an arranged marriage, but it was certainly one that was well um, overseen. And with all that time, you got to know this person. And believe it or not, a lot of people who were physically attracted to each other in the beginning didn't get to the stepping out stage. It's like, me, nah, I'm just not interested. Now, had they immediately jumped and got a hotel room, it may have been too late, right? Next thing. Um, in the relationship, any relationship, uh, giving the virtue in the relationship, and I like this um, concept, giving. Happiness for giver and receiver. Yesterday I shared this in the youngest group. Relative, relatively speaking, compare between the receiver and giver. And when I say receiver and giver in general, uh, spiritual gift or time, which way, which one you think is have more happier? 
receiver or giver? Who say giver? Raise your hand. Ah, majority. Who say receiver? Raise your hand. See you after this. See me after this session, okay? <laughs> you completely, totally correct. But my question is, how many times you practice giver? Please raise your hand. I don't say believe, I say practice. You see the numbers? Oh no, you can't. We know that the practice is really hard, right? We want to get more rather than offer. So practice, we better to remind ourselves, offer, giver, try to become a giver, mindful giver. Don't give to the wrong person, okay? Uh, yesterday someone asked me the question, sometimes they get upset because they make a big donation to the wrong person, quote unquote. That is because you don't have a true love, compassion, and understanding. So also pay attention about this. And another thing I just uh, asked you, what is important gift in the relationship, in your own opinion? What is the most important, important gift in your relationship? Love, understanding. Say it. You have a relationship. Speak up. Huh? Diamond. Diamond. That's the true voice. Um, but research indicates differently. Diamond is very important, but it's more important that you have to. Pay attention to each other, share time for each other, and care for each other. And remember, happiness is not only for yourself, right? You have to care for the other. So try the best to balance between your own happiness and the other happiness. The next is, I think we just go a little bit about this direction. I'm actually going to skip over this because I think it's going to be, yeah. Um, one last thing I want to say about this. Um, Recently, my son and I were in the mall in Bangor, we were going to a movie, and there was a homeless man standing there with a sign, and it said, Hungry, please help. And I pulled over and I gave him some money. And my son says, What did you do? I said, Well, I, I gave that man some money. He says, Number one, he's probably not homeless. Number two, this is probably a scam. Number three, you are a nationally known expert on behavioral dynamics. Don't you think this man chose this life? I said, Well, yeah, maybe, but you know what? I didn't give it to him for him. I gave it to him for me. Yep. Um, so, discovering what the other person needs. Ask questions. Open it to questions. Do you like Jello? Yes. Okay. How about what? What are your favorite foods? Vietnamese. Okay. Have you ever heard this conversation? Okay. I have. For decades. What do you want to do for supper? I don't care. Really? Chinese? I don't want that. Filipino? I don't want that. Okay? McDonald's? I don't want that. Okay, so clearly you care. I'd like to go for Chinese tonight. Would you? Not tonight. We just had it twice yesterday. Okay, what do you recommend? How about Thai? Good idea. Open ended questions. Self disclosure. I do this all the time with. With, well, I used to with my with my clients. Blah 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 blah. Well, you know what helps me? When this happens in my life, this is what I do. So I put myself out there. And when you're dealing with somebody in a relationship, any kind of a relationship, identify their problem by saying, "You know, well, I too have had this problem. This is what I have done." Never say, "Hey, you need to do this," and you no. That's what I've done, and it worked for me. Yep, I know that. Expressing objection, okay, um, I want to just... Yeah, I also uh, add this a little bit quickly. In terms of practicing Sangha, please feel free to make any uh, request you think is benefit, not only the relationship between your wife and your husband, but also in the community. I know most of you go to the temple every Sunday, I hope, or monthly. Feel free to express what you expect from the monk. 
I think you should let your monk know what you want. I can see the, uh, the Buddhist temple is the place where we sell a spiritual product. <laughs> and you are the buyer, okay? What, 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 what would you like to get from the temple every Sunday? Just let me know, right? You like to practice this meditation, chanting, or even dancing like we did last night? <laughs> Just let me know. Uh, the last thing that I would say about that is acu accusatory language. You always, you never. Seriously? Yes. They always do? They never do? No, I think maybe that's the way you, you're taking it. Uh, we've already covered this, okay? Impasses, we've already covered that too. Wow. All right. Oh, we're yeah, we receiving complaints, yeah. If you have a complaint, talk to Tay. <laughs> Paraphrase your complaint. You're always wearing that stupid dress. Why are you wearing that dress again? Don't be accusatory. There are two ways to, 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 to formulate every question. Always put it on you because you're the one with the problem, not them. I don't like those flip flops. <laughs> you wear stupid shoes. I think so. <laughs> That's the last thing I wanted to say. Um, and I'm, I think we might have run a little bit past. We have no more time. I'm so sorry about this. It's uh, your fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Dr. David and uh, Thay Quan, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, session and it's benefit us right here. It's a matter of the heart. So we have learned a lot. We're going to promise to take it, do it, do it now. And bring it home, do it at home and every day. So very pleasure and very honored to have you. And we wish that in the future we create more changes so we can have you be with us more. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and I appreciate appreciation and for the memory of 2003, the retreat came. Yes, we have two big diamonds in there. One for Thai and one for Dr. Davis.